All right, folks, Ishai Fleischer here, broadcasting live from the Tomb of the Patriarchs and Matriarchs. I'm right outside the Tomb of the Patriarchs and Matriarchs. Wanted to do a little recording for you. This week has been very, very hectic. I am now a councilman of my city, one of the 11 councilmen of the city that I live in here in Judea. And so that's been very, you know, political and hectic. Uh, and groups and other things that have happened this week. A lot is moving forward. You know, the Jewish people keep moving forward. We take, we take many steps forward and a few steps back from time to time, but we're still fighting very hard to root ourselves in this good land, to root ourselves in this good land. And as we move forward on this process, there are many, there are many efforts to try to stop us. There's been such a, you know, when I look at the social media out there and I look at the pressure that the world puts on Israel, to what? To stop living in our ancestral homeland? It's just so silly, right? If you think about it, it's like we're making a war against really bad enemies. Like, no, don't make war. We're settling our land. They're like, no, don't settle your land. So it's really pretty wild, the, uh, the effort to, to try to stop the Jewish people from coming home. And I really am so thankful right now to just be walking with you uh, here right next to the tomb of the mamas and the papas, right at the very corner of the building. I see a lady. She's just sitting there saying her prayers. Uh, and we're right outside, it was raining earlier today, but now it stopped raining and the sun came out. Very special place, such a special gift to be able to, 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 to walk in this land and to think about you wherever you are. And I want to send out a signal to my uh, Abrahamic sons of Abraham, children of Abraham, um, Bnei Avraham, uh, the Abrahamics, the, the house of Abraham folks. That means the, the non-Jews that are out there connecting to the story of Israel, connecting to the love of the Bible, of the Torah, uh, and connecting to what I think is your rightful heritage, which is children of Abraham. I think that um, I had a talk with Jeremy Gimpel and Ari Abramowitz yesterday, and they, they went to see a very important rabbi, Rabbi Yitzchak Ginsburg, and, and we were talking just about you know, the, the, the motion of the nations coming closer to Israel, and um, through the conversation, I just had the realization that as I'm pushing this, this, this brand, which I think is, is an identity brand, which is Abrahamic, uh, its, its, its root is right here at the tomb of Abraham, uh, where Abraham purchased property. I mean, a biblical figure purchased, the, the biblical founder purchased a piece of property, and everybody wants to stop that from coming to fruition. And so when you're a lover of Israel, then I know that uh, you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and for, uh, and for the rights of Jewish people in Hebron, and for our ability to visit this place, and, um, and to connect to the pathway of Abraham. All right, so let's have a little bit of fun. I don't have a lot of time today, uh, but that doesn't mean I don't love you. It's just been a hectic week. And I want to thank the good friends that make the show happen, Ben Bresky, Yocheved Seidman, Tabitha, Moshe, Lou, and we're live, and Dovid for our social media prowess. Um, I want to um, I want to start with a reaction video that I did uh, with John Stewart. Yeah, John Stewart was out there, uh, you know, you know, poking fun at our situation here in the Middle East. But I wanted to make some points, and I think they're important. And so here is John Stewart. I think there might be some expletives that uh, shouldn't be there on this family type show, but still, you'll be able to deal with it. Uh, bottom line is that uh, John Stewart. Uh, out there talking about Israel and uh, what in his comedic mind uh, uh, we should do uh, about our land and how we should defend it or, or, or lack thereof. So here's uh, Yishai's commentary on Jon Stewart. Jon Stewart is always entertaining, but not exactly on point when it comes to solutions. It's not exactly like I go to Jon Stewart to find the solutions for the Middle East, but he insists on talking about Israel. Let's see what John has to say in his latest segment about uh, our region here. Here we go. <laughs> We're going to take a look in our new and probably never-ending segment. I mean, before he even goes on, I just want to say, like, okay, he calls it the futile crescent. That's funny, you know, like the fertile crescent, the futile crescent. Good one. But you know what? I wonder sometimes, I, I'm just like, if you think it's so futile, why do you have to get into the business of our region? Maybe just, maybe just, maybe just a, a, an idea that hasn't crossed your mind, John, is that, is that maybe you don't have to get involved. I know you're a news guy and you like to analyze the news. I get it. But I mean, you're going to call it futile. We don't think it's futile. We actually think that we're living in the most exciting part of Jewish history in the last 2,000 years. We're coming home. There is nothing futile 
about the time that we're living in. We're living in an amazing time, a time of rebirth, a time of new opportunities for the Jewish people and for Arabs as well and for peoples of, of this region. But okay, futile because you can't solve the conflict. I get it. Uh, but let's let's keep getting entertained by John. Somehow the audience knew, but tonight <laughs> we discuss Israel-Palestine. Any discussion of Israel Palestine is not meant to endorse or justify all the actions of either side. Mentions of Hamas that fail to condemn Hamas do not mean we don't condemn Hamas. Do not listen to this segment if you're predisposed to anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. Common side effects of discussing in the Middle East are depression, anxiety, infections of the perineum, and craving Hamas. <laughs> I told you it's entertaining. Well, folks, uh, uh, this is an awful situation. We're, we're coming off uh, on five months of a brutal bombing campaign brought on by a horrific massacre and hostage taking, and we seem no closer to ending anything but the reigns of a couple of Ivy League presidents. <laughs> well, this weekend, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu finally laid out his plan for peace. Benjamin Netanyahu is calling for complete demilitarization of Gaza, as well as Israel taking over security and controlling entry and exit points to Gaza. So your peace plan is a siege, <laughs> a military siege. You really think a military solution ends this cycle? Well, victory is within reach, and you can't have victory until you uh, eliminate Hamas. But, oh, okay. But your plan to eliminate Hamas by destroying all of Gaza, uh, doesn't that just make more Hamases? <laughs> Is that the plural of Hamas? <laughs> Hamasai? <laughs> I mean, it's an idea. Palestinian liberation is an idea. Unless you have a bomb. That Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Pay attention here what's happening. Netanyahu is like, he didn't say that he's going to destroy Gaza. What he said, he's going to make it into a militarized zone where Israel's military is going to defend the place, make sure that Hamas, the organization, doesn't take over. Now, Hamas itself does not say that it's a Palestinian liberation organization. That's the PLO. What it says is that it's a jihadist organization. What it says is that it's there to not just liberate uh, uh, the world from Israel and destroy it, uh, but actually to instill Islam as a global value. They're a full-on jihadist organization. Read their, uh, read their platform. They say it clearly. Uh, th they think that that the world needs Islam, that Israel is just a crusader, that it's a big, you know, we have to push back on Europeans and, and, the, and Christendom, and Israel is part of that. And, and John Stewart here is, is like, he's, he's not taking it seriously. Netanyahu is like, listen, I've got to govern Gaza. That's another way of saying it. I've got to govern it. I don't have to destroy it. I have to destroy that organization within it. But what Stewart says is he says, look, uh, Hamas stands for liberation of Palestine. No, they don't. They stand for something much bigger. If they would stand for the liberation of Palestine, they would treat their own people decently, which they don't. They torture their own people. They kill their own people. They starve their own people. They use them as, as human pawns. Uh, they're not interested in the limited goal of liberation of Palestine. It's a global agenda, uh, part of the Islamic Brotherhood, uh, sadly also become related to Iran today. And so Netanyahu is like, listen, I've got this border problem. I'm going to use my army to control the borders so that this organization, this Nazi-like ideology, you know what it's like? It's like, it's like, do you equate between Nazi and Germany totally? Do you equate between that? Because what you're saying is, is that Hamas, the Nazis, are trying to get liberation for Germany. Is that really what the Nazis were doing? No, they had a, a global a goal. They had a global agenda uh, to, to capture uh, the world and take destroy countries like Czechoslovakia and Poland. Uh, and they had a, a much bigger agenda than just a free Germany. And so this is one of the common mistakes. It's like, it's like, he's basically like, it, it's very smooth, but what Stuart is saying is, and it's a very smooth, tiny transition is he's saying Hamas is actually a legitimate freedom fire fighter trying to get rid of, of Israel to make a liberation for Palestine. No, they're not. It's a much bigger thing. And he's going to play a clip later that proves that. But but that slip right there, that, that little logical leap is something we got to watch out for. It kills ideas. Do you have a bomb that kills ideas? <laughs> I mean, how long would it even take to bomb this shit out of an idea? The intense phase of the fighting is weeks away from completion. Not months, weeks away from completion. Oh, dear God. 
if you insist on this plan, if you think that... What, what, John, do you want us to do with Hamas? Do you want us to just like let, let Nazi uh, murderers, rapists and stuff just hang out on our borders? Is that what you want for us? Is that, is that your vision for, for peace? Is, do you think that that's good for Arabs, by the way? No, it's not good for Arabs. And it's not good for the Jews. And, and what is it that you're making fun of? That what? That we want to fight them and we have an intense period where we're destroying their tunnels and destroying the, the fighters? To me, it seems not so funny. It seems kind of like I'm not even, I don't think other people in the audience are really laughing either because it's like, what exactly are you making fun of? That we have a military operation, that we're kicking their butt uh, and, and, and making sure that the jihadists know that we mean business when they start up with us? So I don't quite get this tech at all. I'm sorry. And Hamas, I believe we in the United States have a banner you can use. <laughs> um, it's a little wind damaged, but... Equally delusional. Well, here I have to agree with the, with the Stuart in that and that we can't say mission accomplished when we get rid mission accomplished when we get rid of Hamas. That's for sure not, uh, because jihadism is a much broader thing. It's got its centers in Iran and in Turkey uh, and in and in Jordan and in Egypt and in Saudi Arabia. Even remnants of it, uh, jihadism, the ideology of it, is much bigger. So you're right. We're not going to be able to claim mission accomplished, and and the goals of this war have been very limited. But the truth of the matter is the war is much broader and it's going to take a much longer time than the next small phase. Look, the United States is Israel's closest ally, Israel's big brother in the fraternity of nations, Israel's work emergency contact. <laughs> Maybe it's time for the U.S. to give Israel some tough moral love. This is shameful. There has to be accountability for these war crimes. No targeting civilians in war. Stop the war crimes and the atrocities and end the war today. It could happen right now. Right now! Thank you! These atrocities must be... So I'm being told the administration was talking about Russia bombing Ukraine. I apologize. <laughs> also a war crime. Uh, but I'm I mean, that, that's funny because that really is the truth that that, you know, the administration has nothing to say about war crimes because we're doing our very darn best. In my opinion, too soft. We're, 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 we our gloves are you know, we, we are really treating this with kid gloves. We're we're too uh, hamstrung, hamstrung. We're too uh, uh, limited in our in our effort to destroy the bad guys. We we take too many of our own casualties in order to safeguard the civilian casualties. So that that is that is a that is a problem. But he's right that the administration was calling out, you know, the war crimes uh, that Russia is, is perpetrating uh, in Ukraine and that whole battle. The bottom line, you can't really say that about Israel, uh, even though there are, of course, civilian deaths. And we have to say that out loud and, and with clarity, which is this is a war. There's a war happening here. And that war is going to take the lives of people. And I also think that it's important to say that Hamas is interested in the death of, uh, of Arab civilians. They're interested in that because that is part of their argument, which is, look how bad Israel is. So they actually want a lot of people to die so that they could use that uh, as one of their tacks out there. I'm sure they're giving equally stern advice to Israel. The Biden administration is urging Israel to be much more careful, to be more cautious. How Israel does this matters. Israel must do more to protect innocent civilians. We want to see the government of Israel take steps to minimize civilian harm. Be more surgical and more precise. Be more careful. Hey, Israel! Take it down the nuts. <laughs> could you please be more careful with your bombing? It's good advice. But really, could the United States have told Israel that when we gave them all the bombs? We're, there are bombs. There's, this is like your Coke dealer coming in with an eight ball and going, don't stay up all night. First thing is this, this whole attitude like, like the United States gave um, Israel the bombs. Israel is a, is a, is a strong and independent and wealthy nation. Uh, we have a relationship, a military relationship with the United States. When we have bombs in our disposal, it's for the usage of warfare so that we can defend ourselves. Uh, do you really want to give people bombs and then telling them, you know, watch out? That's what that's what he's laughing about. And I think that's true. What, what exactly do you expect? We have a war thrust upon us. We're going to strike back hard. John Stewart, I wish you would understand that Israel does not have the leisure to uh, play around with enemies that, that really are armed, 
with both physical arms and with ideological arms to destroy us in toto. They want to destroy Israel. And we're not playing around here. And that's the thing. John Stewart, God bless him, is a play around guy. He's playing around. But he doesn't understand the severity of the situation. He doesn't understand the enemies that surround us. And he doesn't understand that we have to give an answer that's 10 times as strong uh, as the attack that we face. Uh, that's the way it has to be around here. That's the only way you'll get respect in the Middle East. Don't. Sleep is very important. You got to sleep. You don't want to. It's, uh, and breakfast is an important part of the day. So, <laughs> Look, the Israeli position doesn't seem so tenable. Perhaps I can find some diplomatic leeway in the Hamas position. Israel is a country that has no place on our land. We must remove that country. Does that mean the annihilation of Israel? Uh, yes, of course. I cannot find <laughs> diplomatic leeway in the Hamas position. <laughs> well, this is when we need the world, the civilized. So before we go on to uh, how John Stewart thinks the world is going to save everything, um, he played that, that tiny segment about Hamas. Compare that to Netanyahu. Netanyahu is like, okay, we're going to have a limited uh, military goal here. We're going to make sure that the entrances and the exits are secured. We're going to find the Hamas fighters, destroy them. But nobody's talking about, you know, a genocide. Here in that one tiny segment, you have the Hamas spokesman being like, yeah, we're here to destroy Israel. John Stewart does not, he, you know, he, he put that on and that's great, but he doesn't get it. They mean business. John, you got to understand that. They mean business, these guys. That's uh, Iran with a nuclear bomb. Uh, that's uh, Hamas with these tunnels. They mean business. That, that's Hezbollah with those 150,000 rockets. They want to destroy Israel. Do you understand that? Do you understand what an existential threat really is? Like, th does that compute to you what it is to live like a Jew in the Middle East who really doesn't have where to turn? We look around, look look to the north of us. It's, it's, it's Lebanon and Syria and Turkey. And, and to the east, it's Jordan and Iraq uh, and, and the Gulf and the, uh, Iran. We look to the south, we see Saudi Arabia, we see Egypt. We see a lot of tough places. We don't have any respite. And we got to take these kind of things seriously. So, you know, it, it may sound funny or it may sound like something you could gloss over. But when those guys say that, that they want to destroy Israel, they mean it. I frankly respect them. I respect that Hamas spokesman. He doesn't mince words. He's not John Stewart out there playing around. He's being darn serious. He's like, that's what we're about. I actually respect that. Not like that. I respect that. I'm like, you guys want to destroy Israel. And so we want to destroy you before you get us. So it's really pretty simple. Uh, and that's the intensity of it all. And in comedy, you can't be so intense. And it's fun to laugh and it's fun to be, you know, cute. But that's who we're really dealing with. And they, on October 7th, took it to that level, took it to the level of they're showing you what they're capable of. This world of nations to come together and stop this madness. A resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza has just failed to pass. A UN Security Council draft resolution to allow aid delivery has been vetoed. Russia and China used their veto against an American resolution condemning Hamas. The immediate ceasefire in Gaza has failed. Western nations voted against it. It was delayed four times this week. Draft resolution has not been adopted. Why do you even have a f***ing building? <laughs> Why? Why do you? We could use that. We have a housing crisis. Give us back our f***ing building. This is not right. Well, I mean, I mean, with all the stuff that John Stewart was saying on this program, which I didn't find so compelling, this one I agree with. There is a useless building in this world. It's called the United Nations. This is an organization that has only done harm. It's, it's just not a good organization. It's, it's run by all kinds of non-democratic, thuggish type of regimes. Uh, and on top of which, it's, it's just not in any way useful in the world. It, doesn't, it hasn't done one good thing. Here in Israel, it has created organizations like UNRWA, which perpetuate Palestinian victimhood, professional victimhood, and professional refugee status, endless refugee status, instead of trying to help them matriculate into society. Uh, and so that's, that's a very bad organization. It gets a billion, billion and a half dollars a year. So UNRWA is one of the great fails of the UN. And then there's the other one that I also fought, which is UNESCO, which is an organization dedicated to uh, uh, um, identifying 
and recognizing uh, heritage sites, world heritage sites. Well, they came to the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs here in Hebron, uh, which is a 2,000-year-old a, a Jewish building built by a Jewish king on top of Jewish tombs from three and a half thousand years ago, and they recognized it as a Palestinian world heritage site. So this is a totally fraudulent organization, absolutely you know, not to be respected. And these are UN organizations. So me and John Stewart are in full agreement America, stop housing the UN. New York, stop housing the UN. It's a total waste of money. It's a totally you know, empty space that could be used so much better. Instead, it's just fat cats getting money for doing nothing. Forget it. The UN is a travesty. What is, what is the United Nations even? What are you, just a support system for a diverse and pleasing food court? What are you? That cannot be the UN's food court, by the way. That is, that is clearly just a mall in Long Island. Doesn't anyone care about the suffering of all these civilians? What about a good neighbor, Saudi Arabia? By the way, uh, did the Arab world care about the uh, 500,000 Arabs that were murdered at the hands of the Syrian regime, of Bashar al-Assad? I don't think they did. I don't think anybody did. I think what people really care about is trying to stop Israel and shrink Israel. Uh, I think we're the only ones that care about Arab lives is Israel uh, because Hamas uses them cynically. Egypt won't let them in. Um, I just don't think really anybody cares, but they only care because they want to stop Israel from getting strong. That's that's a big thing that they want. They want to make sure that Israel doesn't become you know too much of a powerful state. That's That's something that the world is very concerned about. That's really one of the great motivators of a lot of these solutions. It's like the solution is, how can we weaken Israel? The whole, the whole concept of Palestine is in order to weaken Israel. That, that is its whole uh, uh, modus operandi. That is what it's there for, that it's resin debtor. That's what it's trying to do in this world, which is to, uh, which is to, to weaken Israel because the international, those, those forces, not the international community, those forces uh, have a problem with a strong and big Israel, and they've been wanting to shrink it ever since it was born. Uh, but here, uh, uh, John is asking about Arab countries and what they're doing. The Palestinian cause is the Arab world's most important cause. I want to see really a good life for the Palestinians. Thank you, Saudi Arabia. Thank you. And while Saudi Arabia does not accept Palestinian refugees, and Egypt doesn't either, for that matter, the Saudis are the richest country in the region, and they've given... <laughs> this can't be right. Uh... <laughs> on average, about $200 million a year to the Palestinians. Jesus, are you kidding me? The Saudis have given just as much money to Phil Mickelson. Is that true? I assume, I assume to promote the equally important cause of the Mickelsonian people. I mean, let's just ask one simple question, which is why does Jon Stewart think that Palestinians need money. Why does he even why why does he even say that? Like, what does that have to do with anything? Do you think that throwing money on these on these people will somehow solve the problem? Do you have this Western concept that they're lacking in money? First thing, they're not lacking in money, and second thing, money is not the issue. What's at issue here is is ideology, jihadism, religion, history, uh, a will to shrink Israel to keep Israel small. Remember, and I talk about this on all of my you know podcasts and video casts, which is that. Islam has got a big problem with Israel. It's got a big problem. What's the problem? First is that we're supposed to be a religion that has left the scene. Uh, and Islam is supposed to be replacing us. So that's annoying that the Jews are still around and still kicking. And then, and then to add insult to injury, to have a shiny Israel in the middle of the Arab world where Islam had once ruled under Turkey and the Mamluks and all that, and now to have a shiny Jewish state, and to lose land, it's a precept in Islam, Islam not to lose land. So that's the problem here. Uh, but throwing Western money at it or, or Saudi money, it's not going to solve the problem. That's, that's not the issue at all. And so it's funny to me that, again, it's a very you know Western concept, which is like we could solve it all by throwing some cash at it. So Israel, the United States, the United Nations, the Arab nations, no one seems to be incentivized to stop the suffering of the innocent people in this region. Now, I didn't want to bring this up, but there is another player. Small religious startup out of Bethlehem. 
I think it might have began as a carpenter's union, but <laughs> has gotten big. Do they have a plan for the Middle East? There will be the Battle of Armageddon. Jesus Christ is going to sweep over that battlefield and to annihilate that army of 200 million people. The blood will flow to the bridle of a horse. So that's the plan for the Prince of Peace, is that so? I am not an equestrian expert, uh, but if the blood goes all the way to the bridal, that's an enormous amount of blood, no? <laughs> Unless, uh, are we talking about the mini horses? Because that's still, <laughs> it's a lot of blood, but more manageable. <laughs> and adorable. Okay, so John Stewart is being very cute here and very funny. Um, and he's, you know, making fun of uh, Christianity in that there's like this vision of rapture and this vision of, uh, um, you know, of, of the end of days and the blood will, will, will flow to the bridal. First thing I want to make, a, um, I want to make it clear that, uh, I, uh, you know, represent Orthodox Judaism, uh, and not Christianity. And we just, uh, don't buy into the Christian texts. Just that's the way it is. And for us, they're just not holy and, and, uh, they, they're not part of our makeup, uh, nor are they prophetic in our minds to what's going to happen in the future. Uh, John Stewart needs a, a vision. The vision is actually so simple, and it's amazing to me that John Stewart cannot see uh, this simple, simple, and, and, and like it, like it's just plain. It's right in front of you, which is a whole and strong Israel and Jewish people living on their ancestral homeland in safety and security, surrounded by Arab states, the many Arab states, twenty-two Arab states living in safety and security in their ancestral land, and together. We work for better regional peace and cooperation, cooperation and peace, uh, and um, uh, and um, and all manner uh, of success, tourism, medicine, uh, roads that interconnect. Uh, you know, I have a dream that we'll have a road all the way from Istanbul coming down and go to Alexandria uh, in the west uh, and uh, through Jerusalem. And then now through Amman and through Baghdad and all the way through the Persian Gulf uh, and, and down to Jeddah and, and Mecca and, and all these places. It's like, it's like it, it can happen. It could happen. Riyadh, it could happen. Uh, we just have to give up this idea that Israel is going to be destroyed or cut, cut in half or cut in pieces. We got to give up those ideas. So strong, tiny Israel surrounded by strong and successful Arab countries working together for regional cooperation. That's the answer. And it's just too simple for smart people to, to, to be able to grasp. It's just too simple. It's like a strong Israel on its land, no bad guys surrounding or trying to kill it, and then cooperating with, uh, with, with regional folks for, for look, look, at, look at you know any place that's normal. Look, look at states. They have their borders and there's states around them. We work together for, for a better future. They work together. Europe has got states. It's, they have their borders. Then they have you know other countries next to them. Try to work together for a better future. Try to make roads and and commerce between them and tourism. That's that's the answer. And I'm telling you, the reason people don't like it is because they won't be get, be able to get make a PhD on it or or run an organization and fundraise on it. It's just too simple. Israel on its land, with minorities that respect it, in its in its borders, uh, in cooperation with other countries that live around here in, in, in peace and security and want to cooperate and accept the fact that Israel is going to be here. The real issue here, John Stewart, is acceptance. They don't accept the idea of Israel. And sometimes you just have to war with them until they accept it. That's just the, the sad reality. Look, I think... I think we have to get real here. The status quo cycle of provocation and retribution is predicated on some idea that one of these groups is going to go away. And they are not. If we want a safe and free Israel and a safe and free Palestine. We so first thing is, yes, the jihad will go away. Yes, it will be defeated. Yes, Hamas will be defeated. It will go away. It will not be here one day. And second thing, I don't want a Palestine on my ancestral land. The Arabs have their lands. Allah has blessed them and given them their lands. I always tell them, Allah has blessed you but this is our land. And I don't want 
half of my country to be given over to terrorists so that they can continue to do what they did on the 7th of October. We've done land giveaway, John Stewart. We've done that and failed. So please don't send us down that route again. Of course, you don't make policy. You're just a comedian in America. Um, but you seem to be very interested. Is it because you're Jewish? I don't know. But but the point is, is that you don't have a recipe. If you think that it makes sense that down the line we cut uh, this land up and make half of it a Palestine and it'll become a terrorist state trying to destroy the rest of Israel, you're the one living in the futile crescent. You're the one in the futile crescent. We have to recognize that reality. And I know that there is a twisted and much contested history in the region that has brought us to this point. But we are at this point. And anything we do from here has to look forward. So tonight, lucky you, I'm going to do that with not one, not two, but a three. <laughs> Solutions for peace. Number one. I like this. I like this part. At least John Stewart is like, okay, I'm going to bring some solutions for peace. I like the way he's thinking. And and I wrote a, a New York Times article in, in February of 2017, which was five alternatives to the two-state solution. So I like this kind of language. Like, okay, let's start thinking about it. Of course, it's comedic, but there's but there's cute stuff here. Let's take a look what Stewart has to say. Along the shores of Pleasant Lake in Maine, 95 Israeli and Palestinian teens are trading rockets for rackets. The goal of Seeds of Peace is to open these young minds. <laughs> okay, that one hasn't been scaled up yet. <laughs> and may take longer than we have. Unless we just bring the whole region to Maine. <laughs> How fast can we make 14 million rackets? <laughs> but that's just my opening offer. That was just one. All right. So that's, that was a cute idea, which is, which is his idea here is like, okay, you know, bring them together and have conversations for peace. That's good. But, but you can't just, it's not just people to people. The thing about Westerners is that they don't understand is that Israel and this region is about history and about religion. And just because you have a good relationship with somebody doesn't mean that the war is over. It just doesn't work that way around here. It might work that way in America, but it doesn't work that way around here. So that's that's issue number one. Issue number two is we actually do have a movement like that. It's called the Abraham Accords. But again, it's predicated on the idea that you don't get rid of Israel or cut it in half. Okay? If you don't want to get rid of Israel, you don't want to cut it in half, you actually want to do business and cooperate with it. Great. There, there's 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 an opportunity there for prosperity, uh, but it's not about and, and people can meet and Arabs and Jews can connect and we're cousins. Don't forget. Uh, but it's not about cutting the land up. So uh, option number one, let's call it the Abraham Accords. Good idea, but let's not cut up the land. Peace plan, people. Don't abandon me yet. Number two. <laughs> Let's just ask God. It's his house. <laughs> He's the one who started all this. Just ask God. He can tell us who is right. Is it the Jews? Is it the Muslims? Is it the Zoroastrians? If it's the Scientologists, a lot of us are going to have egg on our faces. <laughs> but given God's lack of communication over this past, let's say millennia, <laughs> I've got to say, I, I got to stop you, John Stewart, and say uh, that was funny. And I love the idea that we got to ask God. And, and we do ask God. It's called pray for the peace of Yerushalayim, pray for Israel, pray for the peace of Israel. So that is very important. You're right. We have to pray to God and ask him to help us have peace in this region and protect his people. God will give strength to his people, Israel, and bless his people, Israel, with peace. Uh, so you're right about that which you're very wrong about and really, really wrong about. I mean, you couldn't be wronger is that you said that God has been incommunicative for the last millennia. The uh, continued thriving of the Jewish people and the rebirth of the Jewish people in their ancestral homeland is the greatest communication that God has sent humanity. There is there's no more great proof of God's, God's existence than the ingathering of the exiles, the rebirth of the Hebrew language, the success of Israel, in spite of uh, all odds, in the face of all odds, uh, that is the greatest communication. God is making his presence uh, shown and known in Yerushalayim and Jerusalem 
Uh, and you would you would do well, John Stewart, uh, to listen a little bit better. Maybe you're he's talking loud and clear, really loud and clear for all the world to see, and you're missing it. And a lot of it is um, is lost. But but you know what? I really felt that this moment, uh, this comedic moment by John Stewart of laughing a little bit and saying like, "God, you've got to you've got to solve things." I liked it though. I liked it. I thought that was actually actually a spiritual moment. Where John Stewart said, okay, you know what I mean? We don't know how to solve it. Turn to God. I like that. But I think God has spoken to us and he has told us how to solve it. It's pretty simple. Don't allow bad guys to take over your land. Be strong, get respect, and then you'll and then you'll you'll get make sure to demand respect and you'll get respect from your neighbors. So first one is the Abraham Accords. Second one is pray to God. That's good. Let's see what else John Stewart has. Here's another one. And heaven forbid, I actually think this last one could work. Starting now, no preconditions, no earned trust, no partners for peace. Israel stops bombing. Hamas releases the hostages. The Arab countries who claim Palestine is their top priority come in and form a demilitarized zone between Israel and a free Palestinian state. The Saudis, Egypt, UAE, Qatar, Jordan, they all form like a NATO arrangement guaranteeing security for both sides. Obviously, they won't call it NATO. It's the Middle East <laughs> Treaty Organization. It's me too. It's Tweet it out. Me too. Tonight, people, let's get this region me too Now, obviously, I have not worked out the exact verbiage, but anything is better than the cluster f cycle we have now. Because honestly, what is the alternative? All right. So that was John Stewart, and he was uh, having uh, having fun. Uh, with our region here, uh, and um, a lot of great comedic moments. That last one, uh, you know, that the Arabs are going to ensure that there's going to be a free Palestine. I I'm sorry, John, it's not going to work that way. Uh, that's what actually happened when Israel uh, uh, pulled out of Gaza, uh, relinquished Gaza to the PLO, and then that became soon Hamas stand, Hamas land, and then they did October 7th after many, many other wars and conflicts that they started. So we have to be real, um, and 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 here's the impulse that John Stewart has throughout the program. America will solve the problems. The UN should solve the problems. The Arab world should solve the problems. And I say to you, we have a much simpler formula, which is Israel should solve the problems with God. I like the God part, but Israel should solve the problem. It's our land. It's simply our land. We have to defend it. We have to make sure that that uh, that armament. And ideology doesn't infiltrate into the Gaza Strip, into Judea and Samaria, the so-called West Bank, and into our neighboring states like southern Lebanon. We got to make sure that doesn't happen. And we got to have a vision. And the vision that you gave, John Stewart, is a weak vision, has been tried to before internationalize Jerusalem, uh, uh, bring the international forces, make a UN force. Uh, all those things have failed and failed and failed. And the one thing that's so hard for people like John Stewart to say is the solution is a strong Israel. A strong Israel on its land with a strong identity and strong Arab states with a strong Muslim Ar Arab identity around us, or at least a godly identity. Uh, that's the solution. Working in cooperation, uh, getting Israel off of its land will only encourage the jihad and will be a failure and will indeed bring about the so-called futile crescents. Crescent, the futile crescent, not crescents. I don't know, Chris, I want croissants. Maybe I'm hungry a little bit. Anyway, God bless you folks, wherever you are. Thank you so much for being with me on Yishai Fleischer uh, TV. Uh, and please sign up for our channel, uh, subscribe, uh, hit the little bell button if you want notifications, uh, and we'll be part of your life wherever you are. Write me an email, Yishai, yishaifleischer.com. Stay connected, write some comments, and love to hear your thoughts. God bless you wherever you are, and shalom. All right, that was some commentary on the John Stewart news show there. Uh, and I hope that uh, that helps you think a little bit about how we want to respond to all the claims against us. Uh, this is Yishai. I'm standing right next to the Tomb of the Patriarchs and the Matriarchs. I want to thank uh, uh, our sponsors to the show, uh, JNS.com and, excuse me, JNS.org and JewishPress.com uh, for great news services, HebronFund.org uh, for keeping this place beautiful as I'm walking right now in this beautiful grass uh, that we support. 
through your help and your connection and love. So that's uh, uh, hebronfund.org. Uh, the good folks that make delightful delights at Prohibition Pickle. And right now they're feeding families uh, that need help. Um, including uh, soldiers' wives, including uh, uh, people that are that have been uh, kicked out of their house or they're 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 run away from their uh, what do they call displaced persons because of this war. So that's also who Prohibition Pickle helps feed. So that's prohibition prohibitionpickle.co.il. Our good friends at RetroWatchGuy.com make an awesome time go. You look down at your watch, you know it's a happy day because you have got a cool watch on your hand. That's RetroWatchGuy.com, and our good friends at Kosher Cycle Tours. Taking us around this land, and actually, speaking of koshercycletours.com, uh, I'll be uh, uh, running the marathon, Big 5K, me and my boy, my 12-year-old boy, we're going to be running 12, uh, excuse me, we're going to be running 5K tomorrow, and that's going to be a lot of fun, so that, that just made me think of cycling through the land. That's going to be in Jerusalem, in Yerushalayim. Uh, one sponsor I didn't mention right now is the good folks at highonthehard.com, and the reason I didn't mention it yet is because this next segment... Uh, that I comment on a CBS video. The CBS video is just so, I don't know, uh, the, the word is, I'll, I'll call it messianically entertaining, okay? <laughs> can, can I use a term like that? It's messianically entertaining. It just, it just put a smile on my face. And this is about the real reason why Hamas started this war. And it's because of the, uh, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll let the segment, I'll let the segment speak for itself. So this is my commentary on CBS's program, but the reason I kept high on the hard.com for last is because uh, MJ, Melissa Jane Kronfeld, who um, is the head of high on the hard.com, she is interviewed by CBS in this segment. So you will enjoy it. Here we go. What was the rationale for Hamas's attack on October 7th? Was it because they sensed that there was a burgeoning peace between Saudi Arabia and Israel? And they wanted to torpedo that. They wanted to torpedo the Abraham Accords. The Jihad didn't want to see Israel normalized in the region. That could be. Could it be because they sensed that there's an American president in the White House that was more favorable to their perspective and certainly on American campus and American support? And so therefore, while this president was still in power, this was the time to do it? Could be. Or was it because they looked at Israel's uh, infighting because of judicial reform and the protests in the street, they sensed that Israel's uh, internal political makeup, its sociological makeup was in distress, and therefore they chose that time to strike. That could be as well. But CBS has an amazing story right now, which I like so much. This is like one of my favorite news pieces in, in a long time. And it it's about something completely different that may have triggered this war. And that trigger may have been the red heifers and the fear that Hamas has, that Israel and the Jewish people are intending to build the third temple. I like this story so much. Let's take a look at CBS and how they covered it. The infamous October 7 massacre that sparked a war. But one confounding yet eye-opening motive has escaped the headlines. In a recent speech, a Hamas spokesman blamed the Jews for bringing red cows to the Holy Land. The cows he's talking about at a secure, undisclosed location are these, red heifers to be precise. Some Jews and Christians believe they're the key to rebuilding the historic Jewish temple in Jerusalem and to beckoning the Messiah. To understand... You All right, so we got these red cows. They're in the land of Israel. And we'll see in a second that they flew in from Texas to the land. And this may have triggered uh, the October 7th war. Let's keep going. You have to go back nearly 2,000 years when the ancient Romans destroyed the last temple in the city. To rebuild it, these believe... The last temple, by the way, is the second temple. And I like that CBS at least admits that there, were, there was a Jewish temple in Jerusalem. They didn't make it clear that there was two Jewish temples, that we had two different uh, sovereignties two different uh, commonwealths uh, here in, in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel, and capital was Jerusalem. But good, okay, we're getting somewhere. At least we're finding out that Jews are indigenous to the land of Israel. They're from Judea. We had temples here. Good, okay, let's keep going. Beavers point to the Bible's Book of Numbers. It commands the Israelites to sacrifice a red heifer without defect or blemish, and that has never been under a yoke. Wait, first thing, can I just mention how they're showing this? Look at this, like, Look at this like paper that they're putting this verse on. Well, guess what? This the verse was not written in English, 
and it was not like on a piece of paper that looks like a Hallmark card, and it didn't have a church background. It was written three and a half thousand years ago. It was given to the Jewish people in Sinai. We're still writing it on ink, using ink, on parchment, and so it has Hebrew letters, and it's parchment. We're still reading that same language that we have in the Bible is the same language that we're speaking today. And so I just want to say it doesn't look that, like that. It doesn't look like a, a Hallmark postcard and a Christmas thing going on. No, that's not where it's from. Only then can the temple rise again. Caring for them on an Israeli settlement in the West Bank. Ooh, ooh where, where exactly? An Israeli settlement in the West Bank? You mean a Jewish community in Judea? Where we're from? Where we were from? This is a Jewish settlement in the West Bank. Sounds ominous. I think it's actually just Jews living in their homeland. It's actually not so ominous. But hey, you know, that's the way that's the way the folks in the West are speaking these days. Is Yitzhak Mamo. So we have here, uh, after a long research, we find in uh, Texas. In Texas? Uh, yeah, yeah. Texas, United States of America. Texas Red Angus flying them 7,000. I just want to say there's a what 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 is called what my friends in Texas call the Israel Texas Nexus. That's right. There's something about Texas. Cool things come out of Texas, and I I'll tell you the truth. That's it's the other Lone Star State, and, and there's a lot of good energy between Texas and Israel. We got to keep developing that energy. Actually, uh, we got to make that even bigger. But anyway, these red heifers flew from Texas to the land of Israel. Thousand miles to Israel. This is not a they were listening stunt. What do you mean? Meaning, this is something you take very seriously. Harry Potter is a good story. The Bible is not story. The Bible is a way of God to lead us. A massive altar already awaits where the heifers are to be burned. According to some believers, the ceremony needs to be performed right here on the Mount of Olives, looking directly into where the temple once stood. But something else now stands in its place. The well, before we get to that, I just want to say something about the red heifer. It's not that the red heifer is this thing that magically leads to the temple. That's that's a total misunderstanding. The red heifer has got a very specific goal. It's got a specific job. And that is, this is very exciting what I'm about to say, to rid Jews of the energy of death, uh, of um, of ritual impurity associated with touching something that died, that is dead. Uh, and death is an energy in this world. It's, it's one of the most powerful energies in this world. It's an energy that takes down all things. Uh, but the Jewish people are an anomaly. They continue to survive throughout the ages. And what symbolizes that more than anything is the red heifer, because it's a way to get rid of that energy of death and to keep going throughout the generations. And that's, that's, that's one of the most amazing things about the Jewish people and a real testament to God's existence. So there's the, uh, the red heifer's purpose. Uh, and that, the, once you get rid of the energy of death, then you could approach the temple and have a temple and, and work in the temple because you're purified from the, the energy of death. But indeed, there is a different energy that's on the Temple Mount today, and it ain't a Jewish temple. Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque, among the holiest sites in Islam. Today, only Muslims are allowed inside, but that's not stopping Jewish activists outside. Once you got, you started here. Well, just, just to make it clear, the Temple Mount is a big platform. In the heart of it is an area that was sanctified for the temple, and Jews are not, not allowed to walk into that sanctified platform. But around the Jews, indeed, do walk on the Temple Mount. And you'll see my good friend MJ uh, here being interviewed about her work to try to get Jews to come to the Temple Mount more often. Six days a week, Melissa Jane Kronfeld leads groups from around the world who defiantly pray, as close as armed guards permit. It's not about the destruction of Islamic holy sites. It's about preserving this place and being guardians over the house of God for all people. So you're happy with it where it is? No, it's going to go 100%, but I believe it's, it, gonna go. it's 100%. Yeah, the whole thing is going to go. We have to build a temple. When you say that Dome of the Rock has to go, so she's saying it's got to go, right? She means that we had a first temple, a second temple. There's going to be a third temple. Now, I'm not about to start World War III right here, okay? But, but the point is very simple. We don't know how it's going to happen. Uh, but that's, that spot that is being guarded, not by a mosque, but, but by a shrine called the Dome of the Rock, that spot marks where the Holy of Holies was and will be. How exactly that's going to happen, I don't know. But what Melissa and MJ is saying here is 
that, that that's the place for the third temple. Again, I don't know how it's going to come about, but that's the spot. That's where it's going to be. That's been prophesied, uh, and that's what the Jews yearn for. Yes. Uh, and so MJ says it kind of unequivocally uh, and and without without messing around. She says it clearly. That's the spot. And and CBS is like incredulous. Go, MJ. It's hard for me to imagine something more incendiary. Well, let me ask you something. Well, it's incendiary that what? It's incendiary that we want a temple there. Go to India and check out what they're doing over there. They they have some uh, uh, some uh, some Indian sites, uh, some some holy shrines that were taken over Hindu shrines that were taken over by Islam, and then the Hindus came back and rebuilt those shrines in the very place where there was a a Muslim shrine on top of their Hindu shrine. So it's not so incendiary. It becomes more incendiary when you make it out to be incendiary. But saying, hey, that's my property. I want it back. That's not so incendiary. The Middle East seems pretty destabilized right now. And the war, if I'm not mistaken, is already here. To be clear, hers is a dream not shared by the Israeli government or by the vast majority of Israelis and Jews. But it's been enough to incite numerous Islamist groups. Hamas has dubbed its October 7 assault on Israel the Al-Aqsa wave and has the Dome of the Rock on its emblem. But this is Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let's let's understand what, what was just said. The Jews getting excited about the Third Temple is incendiary. But Hamas's like overall goal to get rid of Israel and to take the Temple Mount and calling this whole war the Al-Aqsa flood is not as incendiary. The world kind of accepts that. I mean, they keep everything that they put out has the markings of uh, the the Al-Aqsa Mosque, but it's not really the mosque. It's actually the Dome of the Rock that they put on there. And they make that into the call for all their peoples throughout the world. That's the call of the jihad. So for them, it's like they're, they're proverbially building a temple, right? They want to keep it an Islamic holy site and keep the Jews off of it. But when we say, actually, we want to do the same, and you say, I want it to be a Jewish site, and I don't want any jihadis there. Uh, uh, I want it to be a house of prayer for all nations, but I don't want haters to, to get a chance to go there. Well, that's very incendiary, right? Sacred ground to billions of Muslims globally, not just Hamas terrorists, stresses Imam Mustafa Abu Sway of Al-Aqsa Mosque. Al-Aqsa Mosque belongs to all Muslims. It belongs to all Muslims. Ta-da! Because they captured it in the 600s and then lost control of it and then captured it again around in, in the 13th century. It belongs to all Muslims. But the what about belonging, the stuff that belonged beforehand? Who did it belong to? Who did you take it away from? Maybe those people are back. Well, they are back, right? So it doesn't exactly belong to all Muslims. Now, that doesn't mean that Muslims shouldn't have a right to pray because, again, we believe that this place should be a house of prayer for all nations, uh, as, the, as the prophet Isaiah tells us. It's, it's, it's a site to connect to God. It is the spiritual capital of the world. But it's not an exclusive site against Jews. That's absurd. It's supposed to be a site that the Jews control and maintain, and other nations come and connect to the God of Israel. Okay, But this dude does not see it that way. So you'll find reaction from Indonesia to Toronto to New York. That's really given. Al-Aqsa Mosque belongs to all Muslims, and the Muslims today are... Two billion people. Two billion people. Simply by performing. Ooh, don't scare me. You're two billion. We're just a measly fourteen million. But you know the Torah tells us the Bible says that we're going to be the smallest of all nations. But you're still going to control the Temple Mount. I'm. I'm. Listen. Hey, respect. You got two billion. Respect. You're winning it. You're killing it out there. You know. That's 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 great. But it doesn't mean it's yours. It, it means that you've got a lot of people and you've got Mecca and Medina and you've got other holy places and I respect that. But this spot is our spot. Okay, and you're going to have to respect that as well. These acts, are, are these Jewish activists kicking a hornet's nest? They are. <laughs> have, you ever seen, have you ever seen a media, like a, like a bigger feed? It's like, so what you're saying is they're kicking over a hornet's nest. Is that how you want to say it? Because I think it's a good way to say it. It's like, it's like, uh, why don't you let the guy say it? Why don't you just not feed him your your lines, his lines? Why don't you just, you know, let him say it his way? But like, it's like, so you were saying it would trigger World War Three, kicking over a hornet's nest because it upsets 
two billion Muslims. Well, tough nuggies, okay? It's our land. It's our holy place. You're sitting on our holy place, and we know what you're doing. You're trying to do that specifically in order to undermine our claim. All right, let's see what he says. They are. A hornet's nest they're kicking all the way to Capitol Hill. So good to see you here in the nation's capital. Those sacred cows were showcased in Washington at a recent prayer gathering. Many evangelicals believe these red heifers will usher Christ's second coming. And we need the Messiah to come, right? So for me, the red heifer is red for the blood of Jesus Christ. Back in the West. Right, so I want to say something here. I want to say this gently and truthfully. We don't believe in that. We don't believe in, in the Christian theology and in the Christian texts, the so-called New Testament. Sorry, love you guys. I love my friends out there. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to accept those beliefs. I don't. The red heifer does not symbolize somebody else's gods or, or belief systems. No. It symbolizes Jewish purity, purif purification from the energy of death. Uh, and and uh, the temple is a way to serve the God of Israel for all nations, as I said before. But it's not in order to replace Judaism uh, with another religion. And Christianity also was a supersessionist religion that came onto the scene in order to, to kind of replace Israel in their own words, and so too did Islam. So my friends that, that brought over uh, uh, the red heifers, they're amazing people, and all the people that, that love Israel throughout are amazing people, but we got to get educated. we got to get educated what the red heifers are really about, uh, what the Torah, what the Bible that talks about it uh, uh, is asking us to really do, and it's asking us to get closer to him, to the one God, uh, who is the God of Israel uh, based in Jerusalem. In any case, back to the red heifers. Bank, Mamo says the ceremony could take place any day. But can you understand why Hamas could be outraged by something like this? I cannot understand. I love, I love, again, it's like, it's like, it's like, I work for Hamas. I use the language that they want to, 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 to be said out there. What, what does it mean outraged? They're outraged at any Jewish people having control of the land of Israel. They're outraged at our control of Jerusalem. Right? Uh, they're outraged. <laughs> what outrage? What's the outrage exactly? They hate us. They hate us. Today, Hamas, whatever their flag is, is, is the swastika of today. So, yeah, they're outraged. And they certainly don't want us to be moving forward. Moving forward. They don't want us to move forward. They want us to move backwards. They're trying to get us off of our land and out of Jerusalem. And we're not going to allow that to happen. And so here's another step forward. That even if they are right, why they have to slot and uh, rape people to win their war. Terrorists have been... What does that mean? I don't understand what he was saying there. The reason they slaughter and rape and kill is because that's how they want to win their war. I, res I respect that. Meaning to say I respect my enemy and what they're trying to do. They're trying to destroy the Jewish people in Israel. And so therefore they think they're right and they want us out. And it's a conflict. It's a war. People are like, why did Hamas do that? Because they're trying to kill us. Can we make it not so complex? Can we just simplify it for everybody? They're at war with us. War, it's ugly. It comes in different ways. Sometimes, you know, nice nations use incendiary bombs and, you know, light up whole cities. And other people use rape and, and, and pillaging. It's horrible things. They're all horrific things. But, like, that's what the bad guy wants to do. He wants to get rid of us. So don't be so, like, amazed by what, what is he? Why would he want to do that? Because he's your enemy. Because he's your enemy. So keep it simple, and, and we'll understand what we're doing. And, of course, the red heifer, the, re the real word is, the red heifer was a trigger. That's the real, real world. Real word. That's the real word. It's a trigger. It triggered them because they're like, whoa, the Jewish people are moving forward. And so so what I said before, you know what, let's finish it up and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll make that analysis right at the end. Here. And attacking us before we ever dreamed of these cows, he reflects, they don't need them as an excuse to kill. For CBS Saturday Morning, Chris Livesay, Jerusalem. All right, so that's indeed true. They really don't need an excuse. And so remember the question that I asked in the beginning, what was the, what was the thing that caused Hamas to make this attack? Was it Biden in the White House? Was it a divided Israel? Was it the peace with Saudi Arabia? Those are all true. And the red heifers were a trigger. It triggered them. It triggered them to be like, whoa, the Jewish people are moving forward. They're moving forward with a temple in Jerusalem. They're moving forward with peace with Saudi Arabia. They're moving forward 
uh, uh, in, in, in strength and in numbers. It's growing nation and the economy strong. We've got to strike right now. And we've got to bring them down so that they get off the Abraham Accords, get off that track. And we have uh, potentially in the White House and in Iran all kinds of en uh, fr enemies of Israel and friends of theirs uh, that would aid them at this moment. Uh, and that's, that's why the red heifers at the end was a trigger. And are they wrong? I don't think they're wrong. I think that the Jewish people wants to move forward. It wants to move forward. And the red heifers uh, are another sign of a redemptive period and a consciousness that's coming into the world. And Hamas is the anti of that. They want darkness in this world. They don't want God's light to shine from Jerusalem to this world. They want to subdue the world. In their mind, Islam means submitting. And submitting is like subduing. They want everybody to bow down and to put on the burqa and put on the, the hijab and all that stuff. They, 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 they want the whole world to go into their place of darkness. They don't want that light uh, to come out of Jerusalem. So I thought this was a really fun uh, piece out of CBS. And it really, uh, what's fun about it also is that at least it breaks through that conception that it's all about like land and give me this piece of land and or give me these rights and equalities, the two-state solution, give me more uh, 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 freedom of movement and, and, and more welfare. Whatever. It's not about the money and it's not about the rights and it's not about the land. It's about God. It's about the temple. It's about Jerusalem. And at least that CBS got right, that it's about something much bigger here in the Middle East. All right, folks, you are watching uh, Yishai Fleischer TV. Thank you so much. Subscribe to our channel and uh, be part of uh, be part of this great and amazing process of redemption. Write me an email, Yishai, and at YishaiFleischer.com. God bless you wherever you are, and shalom. Don't worry. The Yishai Fleischer show will be right back, so stay tuned. Okay, I hope you felt high on the har. I felt high on the har, that's for sure. I felt very high in the har, uh, and it's strong. And yes, the red heifers... We'll bring it home, baby. We got to bring the red heifers home, and they're going to bring the home down to us. They're they're part of this great uh, rebirth and 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 um, reacquisition of our identity. All right, folks. I am standing here at the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs, uh, but there is one matriarch who's not here, and that is uh, Rachel, Rachel Imenu, the the matriarch Rachel, and she continuously cries for her children. She's buried in Bethlehem, uh, and many people come and visit her every single day. Uh, and it's become even open Thursday nights all night. It's a, a fabulous place. And so therefore, uh, I uh, have the pleasure of introducing our intrepid reporter, Ben Bresky, who has a special segment on a part of the history, part of the very interesting history uh, of Kever Rachel, the tomb of Rachel in Bethlehem. This is a moment in Jewish history. Last week, I talked about the tomb of Rachel, burial site of the biblical matriarch Rachel. Unlike the rest of the patriarchs and matriarchs, she is buried on the road to Bethlehem, whereas Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob and Leah are buried in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron. I have been there many times, and much can be written about it, so I would like to focus on something I mentioned last week, which is that Rachel took one for the team and sacrificed her space in the cave of Machpelah, known as the entrance to the Garden of Eden, while Mama Rachel waits for her children to return to their borders. And this insight comes from a story about Max Nordau. Max Nordau was a close friend of Theodor Herzl and helped him form the World Zionist Organization back in the 1890s. He was born and raised in a Jewish family, but quickly became a staunch assimilationist. He is quoted as having written about himself the following. When I reached the age of 15, I left the Jewish way of life and the study of Torah. Judaism remained a mere memory, and since then I have always felt as a German and as a German only. Nordau became a well-known and controversial writer for his works such as Degeneration and Conventional Lies of Society, but all that changed with the Dreyfus Affair. Alfred Dreyfus was a French officer falsely accused of treason. His trial unleashed a wave of Judeophobia, and Max Nordau was one of the many Jewish Europeans who began to believe that Zionism was the answer. The following story is told by Nordau's friend, the eminent scholar Abraham Shalom Yehuda, in his autobiography. 
On the second night of the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Nordau spoke in German, giving a long speech. He mentioned several times as a motto three words from Jeremiah in Hebrew, V'shavu banim l'gvulam, our children have returned to their borders. When asked by a young representative at the Congress how he found this verse, especially in Hebrew, for this did not fit Nordau's educational background, Nordau replied, I know these words from the person to whom I am obliged all my Judaism and Zionism, a person whose name I don't even know, a person who was, in essence, only a little boy of eight or ten, and this is what happened. I have a children's clinic in Paris. A woman, an immigrant from Poland, her hair covered with a scarf, came in with a pale boy, eight or ten, sick for three weeks. Someone recommended that she bring him to me. I took out a form for a new patient and tried to speak to him in our local language, but he could hardly understand French. I asked his mother, who was also very poor at French, and she said, no, he doesn't go to a regular school, he goes to a cheder, a Jewish religious school. I scolded her harshly. This only causes anti-Semitism. We have opened the door for you, the gates to the country, to refugees from Poland. Why doesn't your child learn the national language here? She apologized and said that he is still young and that her husband is from the old generation, but that he will grow and study in a gymnasium, modern school, and will learn the language. In anger, I asked the child, In Cheder, what did you learn? His eyes lit up, and in Yiddish, which I understood because of my German, told me what he had last studied in Cheder. Jacob, he said, was dying, and he invited Joseph and commanded him, swearing him, pleading before him, Please, don't bury me in Egypt. There is the cave of Machpelach, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebekah, and there I buried Leah. Take me from Egypt and bury me with them. And when I came from Padan... Rachel died in the land of Canaan, on the way to Ephrat, and I buried her there, on the way, in Bethlehem. Why, in the middle of Jacob's request, does he tell the story of the tomb of Rachel? Rashi says, and this is all the child could talk about, eight or ten years old, speaking about the sages, that Jacob felt a necessity to apologize to Joseph and say, I bother you like this to take me from Egypt to Hebron, and I myself didn't bother to take your mother Rachel, and despite that I was very close, next to Bethlehem, even into the city I didn't take her, I buried her on the way. But I am not guilty and did not act wrongly. God wanted it this way. He knew the murderer Nebuchadnezzar would, in the future, exile the sons of Rachel, her sons, during the first destruction, and when she would leave her grave and weep and wail and her voice would be heard, Rachel weeps for her children. But the Lord responds to her, Stop your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, because there is a reward for your actions and a hope for the future, and the children will return to their borders. V'shavu banim l'gvulam. And I, said Dr. Max Nordau, I didn't know what to do with myself. I turned to the window so that the mother and child wouldn't see the tears rolling down my cheeks, and I said to myself, Max, aren't you ashamed of yourself? You are an educated man, known as an intellectual, with a doctor's degree, but you don't know anything about the history of your people. From all the holy scriptures, nothing? And here, this sick child, weak, an immigrant, a refugee, and he speaks of Jacob and Joseph and Jeremiah and Rachel as if it were yesterday. It all lives in front of his eyes. I wiped the tears from my cheeks, and I turned to them and said in my heart, A people with children like this that actually live their past, they will have a sparkling future. In the weekend newspaper, I saw an advertisement. Whoever believes that the fate of the Jewish people is important to them, please call to help find an answer. Dr. Theodore Herzl. I called immediately. When we founded the Zionist Congress at the first one, when I was honored to speak and give a speech, the figure of that little boy, whose name I don't even remember, stood in front of my eyes. But those words I will never forget, because they are the foundation of Zionism. They are the pillar of Judaism. V'shavu banim l'gvulam, and the children will return to their borders. The organization that Herzl and Nordau formed successfully led to the creation of the independent state of Israel. 
Max Nordau is buried in the historic Trumpeldor Cemetery in Tel Aviv, which is located at the end of Hebron Street. This has been a moment in Jewish history. Thank you to Yishai Fleischer. Thank you to all the listeners. And Shalom. All right, Ben Bresky, thank you very much. That was fabulous. You are fabulous. And all our listeners are fabulous. If you love the show, like I love the show, please contribute to uh, buymeacoffee.com forward slash Yishai. It is much, much appreciated. And I appreciate your emails as well, which I have read, but I haven't gotten a chance to get back to all of them. Yishai, Yishai, Fleischer.com. I'm on the way to responding to you. But as I said, hectic week. And I'm sure you had a hectic week. So I'm praying for your success and health. And please pray for mine. Let's, let's send each other positive signals, especially right here at the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs. Let's signal it to each other, uh, the, the love of Abraham, the love of Israel, uh, the, the yearning to, to be connected. Um, special shout out to a good friend, who, a good listener to the show, uh, who is dedicator of uh, some new beautiful lighting at the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs. You know who you are, and I really send you great blessings uh, for that, and you know what project you did. But the place is lit up very beautifully, and I'm very, very uh, thankful to you. Uh, and we are all thankful when we take one step forward to beautify this place. I'm always telling folks at the UAE, I'm like, come on, join up and let's beautify the tomb of Abraham. Let's make it something that's a light to the world. Let's share. In, and all of us, if you think about it, all of us that love the, the legacy of Abraham should share uh, in the light of this place. And as I'm standing here, I'm just like, there's so many visions of how amazing this place can be. Bezrat Hashem, God will help us beautify it, strengthen it, and, and help the Abrahamic light come out to the world. All right, folks, I want to thank everybody who's part of it. I want to thank you wherever you are and send you lots of blessings from the land of blessings. And may Hashem give us strength to continue to fight and overcome. May Hashem give healing to all the families that have been pained and broken, and to all the soldiers and others who, who are injured, and of course, speedily uh, return and, and give um, 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 immediate release to all those hostages and abductees. And Hashem should give strength to His people Israel to stop allowing evil to flourish. Evil should not flourish, and it's Israel's job, amongst other good people, to stop evil from flourishing. May God give us the strength to do His will to help stop the flourishing of evil. And quite the opposite, we got to smoke them out. You know what I mean? All right, folks, lots of love and lots of blessings from the tomb of Abraham, the tomb of Sarah, the tomb of Isaac and Rebekah, the tomb of Jacob, excuse me, Leah, and Jacob, a.k.a., also known as Israel. Shabbat shalom and lots of love, and thank you so much for being with us. We are with you wherever you are, and shalom.